Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Since our last <coughs> press conference in May, shortly after the public protest march, we have heard nothing from the government responding to the concerns of the people and to the questions raised by the Labour Party in relation to DSH. The silence of the government cannot be allowed to continue. Answers must be provided to the people of St. Lucia. We recall the Prime Minister had stated that Phase 1 of the SH had been signed, sealed and delivered with the developer. Yet, we cannot get responses to some of the basic questions which were asked. Accordingly, the St. Lucia Labour Party wishes to repeat some of the questions which were asked and which we <coughs> believe merits a response from the government. One, what is the value of phase one? Two, has phase one received DCA approval? Three, how much money is DSH bringing for the commencement of phase one? Four, has phase one been given CIP approved status? Five, how many passports have been allocated to phase one? Six, is DSH leasing the land at US dollar one US dollar per acre? Seven, will DSH be allowed to use monies from CIP held in escrow to operate the racetrack? Eight, and importantly, have the farmers affected by the scope of the project been served eviction notice? Nine, has there been any changes to the framework agreement signed with the SH, particularly in regard to the buyback clause, the escrow account, the exclusivity arrangements, the sale of Sandy Beach and the stadium, and the leasing of land at $1 per acre? You will also recall at our last press conference in May, I stated that C the CIP unit and Invest in Lucia had done assessments and rejected the DSH application. In response, it was stated by the government spokespersons that I was misleading the public and a joint press release was issued. <coughs> Today I want to share with you two documents <coughs> which I trust you will study and you will share your own opinion as to whether those documents highlight exactly what I said. Both documents show that the professional staff at the CIP unit and Invest in Lucia did not agree that the DSH submission should be approved. I want to share with you the two documents. And in particular, let me just go through one of the documents to give you an indication of some of what came out of the assessment by the professional staff as it relates to DSH. In one of the documents, a point is made that the proposal which was received on March 8, 2016 was the seventh submission by DSH for review, the seventh. And the comment is made that one common feature of all the previous submissions and the present one is that the project would not qualify under the current legislation. And that you will see in the document when you review it for yourself. It is noted in the document that the CIP regulations provides for some measure of CIP financing and equity financing. And that in the submission, almost 90% is CIP and the balance is equity put in by the developer, of which most comes in the form of his professional fees, in effect saying that he's really not putting any money up front. In the submission for phase one, the gross development cost, which is the actual cost of construction and establishing the infrastructure, is 340 million US dollars. 340 million dollars. The developer claims that during construction, between 500 to 800 employees will be at the site, 
During the operational phase, for the race course operation, there will be 150 persons. For equine husbandry, 3,000 persons. Retail and F&B, 2,000 persons. Hospitality and gaming, 2,000 persons. That's the submission by the developer. And the assessment of the team says, it is important to note that despite the employment figures given, the developer has not provided any details on the operational aspect of the project in which the employment figures are based. The assessment goes on. And that's where it's really important for you to know this point. Remember, the gross development cost is 340 million US dollars. Based on the value of the CIP units required, there is a need for 990 CIP units. So he says the development cost is X, he's put in 10%, so he's supposed to get 990 CIP units, which is essentially passports. However, the developer is asking for 1,843 CIP units, which value is 553 million US dollars. There is a difference of US $256 million between the development costs and the value of the CIP units being requested. So the developer said, this is what it's going to cost for me to establish phase one, which means he's supposed to get 990 CIP units or passports, but he wants 1,843. So from the start of the project, he makes a profit on phase one of $256 million US dollars. The, the, in response to the financial viability, the assessment goes on that the project is highly leveraged and the probability <coughs> of success is low. And that's the assessment of the professional team. In conclusion, uh, and also to note, uh, the assessment team also makes a point that the developers provided no evidence of the equity that we'll put in. He states his equity, but he doesn't give ev any evidence of how he'll be able to provide equity, except that it will cover his professional fees. And in conclusion, the, the team makes the point that based on the analysis of the proposal, the, it is recommended that the pool of the Caribbean not be given approval, not be given approval as real estate or enterprise project at this time. Now, when I said so, they said I was lying, but I will share with you the document. Um, and also important to know that the developer says he's not going to start any work until he gets 90% of the cost of the project up front. Now, remember the Prime Minister had said on his interview with Rick Wayne that the developer is going to upfront the money and get the project started, and then he would collect it later on. But in the submission the developer made, he's saying that he needs 90% of the money up front the sale of our passport before you can start the project. So today I'm going to share with you the two assessments that were done and you can make your own assessment of it and see whether or not I had in fact lied and according to the communications persons I was misleading the public by providing false information to them and of course we know the history of the joint statement which was released and at this point we should call on the government to tell us what is the status of the CIP CEO. You'd recall that the CEO was sent on administrative leave, which means that the person had engaged in gross misconduct and was under investigation. It's been a few weeks since that was done, and we've heard nothing about the status of the individual, whether the individual is still being investigated, for what has the individual been terminated. We have no idea. And I think it is time that the Minister of Responsibility for the CIP clearly indicates to St. Lucia what was the issue with the CIP CEO and why was she sent on administrative leave. The CIP is a very sensitive program. What happens in the CIP has far-reaching consequences for our national security and for the image of this country. And persons heard all over the world that the CEO of the CIP unit was sent on administrative leave, which means gross misconduct or being investigated. Yet St. Lucia has not been sufficiently informed as to why and what is the status. Thank you very much.